Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Germany for the week beginning the 15th of September 2014. We'll be bringing you the most important news that has taken place in Germany over the past week. I'm Frederick Colby. And I'm Roland Blake. Learn more about our podcast on our website, thisweekingermany.de. Also, if you use social media like Facebook and Twitter, you'll find our links there as well. This week in Germany, the government has put out an official ban on ISIS. A new proposal outlining a plan to decrease housing costs. In destination Germany, if you fancy some fish but don't want to catch it yourself, go to Hamburg Fish Market. And in our German of the Week section, a politician compares terrorism with education reform. All that and more coming up. Hello, everyone, and welcome to podcast number 38. It's been an uh, interesting week in Germany this week, hasn't it? Yes, and we will get to all of that throughout today's episode. But uh, yes, uh, something which I did recently this week is on Sunday, I went to the rally against um, anti-Semitism, which was very interesting. It was attended by uh, a lot of dignitaries, including Angela Merkel and the, the president, uh, Joachim Gauck. And yeah, it was very interesting. And if you'd like to, to read everything that happened, you can go to our Twitter page, because whenever there's a big event on that we attend, I like to do live tweeting of everything that's going on there. So if you go to twitter.com slash thisweekgermany, you can check out all of our tweets there as well. And also between episodes, you can catch up with the latest German news in the English language through our Twitter feed right there as well. So it's twitter.com slash thisweekgermany. Germany. But um, I guess we should uh, get started with news um, from this week uh, with our first story. Okay. In our first story, this past Friday, the German government has now banned the ISIS, the Islamic State that uh, operates in North Iraq and Syria. And while it does mostly uh, stay in northern Iraq and Syria, it has been kind of a, a threat throughout the world as well. And there are some ideas that it could be harmful to public safety in Germany. So how does a country actually ban a group like this? And is it the uh, similar to how uh, Germany has banned neo-Nazi groups? Yeah, it is pretty similar to that. What they're doing is they're placing restrictions on things like uh, ISIS activities, flags, and even symbols. The outline also bans things like uh, they're not allowed to, uh, ISIS isn't allowed to get together to form demonstrations or even uh, promote themselves on social media within Germany. There are a bunch of other small uh, things that uh, ISIS isn't allowed to do through for this ban, but uh, two other large ones are that they're not allowed to take any sort of donations in Germany for the group. As well, they're not allowed to do any sort of recruiting on German ground for ISIS. So is there any um, uh, anyone from the government, uh, German government who is leading this ban and the push to, to make a ban, which has now gone through? And uh, what do they um, hope to accomplish with it? The main person that's the driving force behind the banning of ISIS is the interior minister, Thomas de Mazier. He said that he believes there is a lot of sport, support for ISIS currently in Germany, over 300 people he believes, and he does not want the jihad brought to German streets. He is also unsure about how the ban is actually going to change or affect public safety in Germany, but he said that should not be an argument to not have the ban for ISIS. He also said that it was just the right thing to do and it would be cynical and irresponsible to show that Germany tolerates this type of situation. And what were the specific reasons listed for the ban? The overall reason is that ISIS is thought to be a terrorist organization, which opposes constitutional order and international understanding. Also, figures are showing that several hundred Germans have joined the ISIS fighting ranks, many of which have been recruited locally in-country. Lastly, arrests have been made just this past week in Frankfurt of known terrorists. And now for this week's news in brief. Angela Merkel, Klaus Wolverheid and Christian Church leaders stood alongside the presidents of the Central Council of Jews in Germany and the Jewish World Congress at a rally against anti-Semitism held on Sunday. 
Chancellor Merkel said that the genuine criticism against any state, including Israel, was entirely acceptable. However, those who took such an opportunity to preach hatred towards Jewish people abused Germany's basic rights of freedom of opinion. She also said it was every German's duty to fight anti-Semitism and to spread a message of acceptance and tolerance throughout the country and to the world. To see images of the rally, take a look at the article on our website at thisweekingermany.de. Documents seen by the weekly news magazine Der Spiegel apparently show that the Secret Service of the United States and United Kingdom have both had access to the Deutsche Telekom network. The article, published on Saturday, accuses the NSA and GCHQ of having found so-called access points to Germany's biggest telecommunications provider. The surveillance project, called Treasure Map, allows the organizations to visualize data communications down to individual routers and devices, such as tablets and smartphones. Deutsche Telekom's head of security promised to investigate the claims and described such a breach as totally unacceptable. State parliamentary elections took place on Sunday in both Brandenburg and Thuringia, with a pattern of political changes now familiar after the recent Landtag vote in Saxony. The pro-business liberals, FDP, a stalwart of the German political scene since the very first national parliament of West Germany, have been voted out of both states, just as before in Saxony and on the national level. Meanwhile, anti-Eurozone party Alternative für Deutschland have gone from nothing to receiving double digits in their first candidacies in either state parliament. Overall, the Christian Democratic Union, the CDU, held their lead in the Thuringian Landtag, and the Social Democrats, the SPD, won the largest percentage of votes overall in Brandenburg. If you would like a weekly update of German news straight to your email inbox, then sign up for our newsletter, available on our website at thisweekingermany.de. Okay, and now it's time for the Quiz of Germany. We're battling it out to become the champion of German general knowledge, and hopefully, maybe we can all learn something along the way, too. Okay, the way this works, if you don't know already, is that each contestant, that is me and Frederick, both get three multiple-choice questions asked to them, and they ask uh, the other in turn, and whoever gets the most is going to be crowned the king of German knowledge when we finally end the quiz yes we ask each other three questions in turn to the other respective person which made it sound very complex we ask each other questions that's basically what's going to happen and i have a coin here to decide who's going to ask um, his questions first so you're going to go for heads okay let's have a look it is heads Ooh, two times in a row yes so would you like to go first with your question asking sure i will ask you questions first I should just say, before we um, start, I'm on 24 points and you're on 19 points. So you're not that far from catching me up. Okay. Are you ready for your categories? Okay. You can choose between German forests, German environmentalism, or German wildlife. German wildlife sounds tricky, so I'm going to go for that one. Okay. <laughs> Give you a chance to catch up. Okay. Which one of these small animals is not found in Germany, other than maybe like a zoo, which doesn't count? We're talking in the wild. <laughs> okay. Naturally. Okay, yes. Yeah. A, a skunk. B, a badger. Or C, a raccoon. I am going to, well, I thought it said both skunk and raccoon. Uh, I know you get badges here. Um, I am going to say a skunk. Hooray! Yes, you are correct. (laughs) A skunk is not found in Germany other than maybe like a zoo. Badgers, yeah, nocturnal creatures are definitely found in Germany. And Germany even has a warning out that they are vicious and should not be approached. Or if if you do, with caution. And raccoons, not native to Germany, but uh, they're from North America. Brought around uh, in 1920 to breed for pelts. And now they are taking over and they have been uh, described as a furry blitzkrieg here in Germany. Okay, that's really weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was thinking, hmm, that sounds more like an American animal. That, but then I didn't want to sound really dumb. But now you've said it. Yeah, it makes totally sense. It's and yep. so now I still sound so. It makes totally sense. It totally makes sense. <laughs> okay, question number two. Um, 
Which wild animal is making a comeback now in Germany? Is it A, the wolves, B, the bears, or C, the leopards? The leopards. I never knew there were leopards in Germany. I'm going to go for A, the wolves, because I don't think anyone would want bears to come back because they can be really vicious, and I think wolves kind of (laughs) stay out the way unless you confront them. So I'm going to say A, wolves. (laughs) <laughs> you are definitely correct. Once again, yes, happy. as of about 2007, the wolves are growing in number, and there are estimated over 200 wolves in Germany today. Uh, bears did make a slight comeback, uh, like uh, I think it was last year or the year before. One was spotted in over 180 years. Hmm. So I guess bears were making comeback, but not quite as much as wolves. So wolves is still the def- uh, best answer. And, uh, Leopards, yeah, there are no leopards. Yeah, well, that one that <laughs> one Germany. bear could have just escaped from the circus or something. I don't know. It's a bit of a fluke. They, they think that is possible. That's, that's one of the theories, is that it, it was an escape from, like, a, a traveling circus. Okay, question number three. Which of these little animals that now calls Germany home once originated from Brazil? Hmm. Is it A, a shrew, B, a nutria, or C, a... The common squirrel. I am going to say the nutria because the shrews, I think they must have been around for a very long time in Europe. Um, I know nutria just stands out. It also has a bit of a weird name, I think, as well. So I'm going to say B, nutria. <laughs> yes, three in a You've row. You've gone, yes, three for three. Shrews are pretty much on all continents other than um, South America and Antarctica. So they're in Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America, but not where Brazil is in South America. And uh, yeah, Nutria, the little water rats, come from Brazil and uh, made their way to Germany around the 19th century. Okay, it's very, very interesting. Great, so now you get to answer my questions now. So would you like to choose language technology, or West German state parliamentary election results between 1945 and 1990? <laughs> um, as tempting as uh, that last one sounded, I'm going to go with language just because <laughs> I need to practice it anyways. Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> which of these is not a real German word? Okay. Oh, man. So which of these is not a real German word? Is it A, Rindfleischetikettierungsüberwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz? That is all one word. <laughs> B, Spätzle. Or C, Kröbel, Winzen, Schmalz, Topf, Alleinchen. So we have Rindfleischetikettierungsüberwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz, Spätzle, or Kröbel, Winzen, Schmalz, Topf, Leinchen. Okay. I feel like I should just know <laughs> the answer here. I want to go with uh, A because it's ridiculously long, but yet it's possible maybe. I feel like I don't know what C is. Okay, can, can I hear C one more time? Uh, yes, you can. C is um, Kröbel, Vincent, Schmalz, Topfleinchen. Okay, that sounds like a food. I'm just going to go with A. You're saying A is... Not true. Not. Yes, I'm going to say A is not a word. No, man. (laughs) I know it sounds utterly ridiculous, um, but the Rindfleisch Etikettierungs um, Aufgaben, Überwachungs, um, so on and so forth, uh, which for short is called Rückergürge or something like that. Um, the, the, yeah. It's all one word, which means uh, cattle marking and beef labeling supervision duties delegation law. Um, yeah. So, yes, that basically was a genuine law which was put forward um, in the state of Mecklenburg for Pommern in 1999, dealing with the supervision and labeling of beef. So, yes. Which one was uh, incorrect? The incorrect one was the last one. I just made it up. Kröbel, Vincent, Schmalz, Oh, man, it sounded, it sounded like such a food. It sounded like uh, some sort of uh, po- or um, some sort of casserole with beef I in it. I think it doesn't follow uh, German orthography laws anyway, so it's ridiculous. But Spätzle is egg noodles. 
So there we go. Yes, Question that is the one that I knew. But <laughs> two, which of the following sentences is incorrect grammatically? So only okay. one of them is incorrectly is incorrect grammatically. A, ich mache das nicht, weil ich das nicht machen möchte. Ich mache das nicht, weil ich das nicht machen möchte. B, du bin einem Dummkopf, da deines Gehirn sind schmal. Or C, was ist hier denn los? So, which one is incorrect? Is it, ich mache das nicht, weil ich das nicht machen möchte? Du bin einem Dummkopf, da deines Gehirn sind schmal. Or C, was ist denn hier los? Um, I know the, the second one was calling someone stupid. How do you say I am in German? Ich How do you bin? say you are? Du okay. bist? So number number one okay. is ich mache das nicht, weil ich das nicht machen möchte. Number two, or, or B, I should say, du bin einem Dummkopf, da deines Gehirn sind schmal. <laughs> And C was, was ist denn hier los? Okay, I'm going to go with uh, B. After that, uh, after that wonderful hint that you gave me. <laughs> yes, I was wondering if you uh, were listening closely enough, but that is correct. Du bin makes no sense. Du bist. And uh, and yes, and da deines Gehirn makes no sense, and it's genitive, and uh, <laughs> and when you have da, you should put the verb to the end, so not um, dein Gehirn sind schmal. That would make no sense because you put the main verb to the sentence, and dein Gehirn ist. I would say so. It's all wrong all over the place, and schmal also. It, it just sounds all completely rubbish. And the first one is I don't want to do it because I um, I won't do it because I don't want to do it. Um, and the last one is what's up here, what's going on here. Number three, what is the name for standard German in German? So this is standard German, the one which is the proper official German that most people speak. Okay. Is it Hochdeutsch, Prostdeutsch, or Normaldeutsch? So which is the German that people learn in schools all around the world? Is it A, Hochdeutsch, B, Prostdeutsch, or C, Normaldeutsch? And go with a Hochdeutsch. Yay! High, High German. German is absolutely correct. So, um, let's see. You, unfortunately, got number one wrong, which means that you have two points, which brings your total points up to 21, while I am at 27 points. So I am very happy with that but still you're inching leading closer the way yes closer um, but if you'd like to submit questions which we can ask each other here on the program all you have to do is go to our website thisweekingermany.de and click contact us and you can submit us questions right there okay let's move on to our next story there's a debate going on right now if the government should help lower housing costs even more than they're already doing. An alliance of German housing-related associations, known as the VBWB, has presented a new plan to help with the high cost of living known as the German Plan for Affordable Housing. They said that housing costs keep on rising and it's a problem for citizens. Their overall view is that this new plan is based on that having a place to live is a right that everyone needs and it should be affordable for all as well. And if the VBWB or um, VBVB, which is pretty cool, has a miracle plan to somehow um, uh, bring affordable prices to um, everyone, what what are they proposing? The overall idea of bringing more affordable housing to Germany is not new, uh, but it is still a very hot topic, especially in Berlin. The main reason is that there's just not enough housing, which makes uh, the current housing not cheap. So the plan is going to be to build more houses rather than try and renovate the, the current houses to try and get cheaper living. To accomplish this, the main, uh, the main idea is to make it easier for companies to start building new housing. I feel the answer to the question of how can we convince more people to build housing in Germany will come at the government's expense and ultimately through the taxpayers. This initiative would be directly through government tax and regulation changes. And yes, ultimately the government is paying for the process, or at least receiving less in taxes than they did before. The VBWB states that these tax changes are needed in depreciation laws, as they are outdated due to the cost going into the building. The reason being is more technology in buildings now depreciates those buildings faster. 
This law update is ultimately more revenue going to those that invest in the buildings. Other ideas are lower land costs as well as lower loan costs for, from uh, Germany's development banks for those building affordable housing. Has the German government, which is in charge of these possible changes, responded? I mean, how likely is it that these changes might take place? Well, it's not looking promising at this point, but it's not completely off the table either. Barbara Hendricks, the environment minister, has cited two large problems. The coalition, the CDU and the SPD, is having tax issues already and the agenda has already been dropped at the present time. Also, real estate development is already very strong in Germany. Tax incentives making it cheaper and easier may lead to depressing this sector. And coming up right now is Destination Germany where each week I do a feature story on an area of Germany that our listeners might like to hear about or even visit someday. Sometimes it could be about a small town with some quaint history and customs, or it could be about the excellent cuisine of a major metropolis. Always, if you like our destinations that we talk about each week, go to our website and you can find some photos of each week's destination right there on thisweekingermany.de. Yes, that's right. And last week we had a really intriguing destination event, um, which was IFA in Berlin, the Consumer Electronics Fair. And uh, this event is a big show where the world's top electronics companies announce many of their new toys and gadgets and innovations to the world before the holiday buying frenzy starts later on in the year. Uh, Bigger and faster mobile phones and tablets were hot this year, of course, as well as new wearable devices like smartwatches. So uh, what is uh, coming up uh, for this week's destination, Roland? Well, last week we uh, saw a fair for consumer electronics, and this week we're going to another fair of sorts, but it's really more of a market for mostly consumable goods. We will be exploring exploring what is... uh, Probably one of the biggest attractions in Hamburg, which happens every Sunday, rain or shine, around the year, down by the docks on Elbestrasse. Ah, yes, I think I know where we're going. Um, we're going to see the world-famous Hamburg Fish Market, or Fish Market. I think I've uh, seen uh, um, one of the famous uh, British chefs went there in his TV shows. I think I've seen about it before, and he said it was great. So it's definitely on my uh, to-do list of places to go in Germany. Well, myself, I can't believe that I've never been there. I've heard all about it just from reading about it or uh, through friends. And we've covered this area in the show a few times before. Uh, It's right next to the the famous other another famous spot in Hamburg, the Reeperbahn, which uh, has people partying to all nights or to uh, all times in the night. As well as this is uh, in the St. Pauli district, which is right where those riots that took place earlier this year. But have no fear, the Hamburg fish market is still going strong. Yes, it's still a pretty popular place from what I hear. Well, uh, the Hamburg port itself is uh, the second most busy port in all of Europe. And they estimate that every Sunday, the fish market draws about 70,000 visitors. Wow, <laughs> yeah. that's big. <laughs> These visitors are a combination of tourists wanting to see what makes this market so famous, locals getting their weekly groceries, shops buying in bulk and as well as uh, those i mentioned earlier from reaper bond the night owls that have partied so late on saturday night that they are just stopping by the fish market to get a nice breakfast before heading home so tell us about this famous fish market uh, what are we going to find there despite the name you're going to find a lot more than just fish while of course you will find some great fish you can pretty much find all types of uh, fresh food from around the world they've got a huge supply of nuts teas and fresh cut flowers It's a mix of indoor and outdoor shopping. There's long indoor buildings that have uh, vendor stalls and places to enjoy some of the food you bought, as well as rows and rows of outdoor open-air vendors selling their wares. And then why is it called the fish market? I mean, if they sell some fish and are located at a port, I mean, (laughs) is, is that the reason? Well, originally uh, it was so this was a place that fishermen could bring all their their catches so they could auction them off to the highest bidder. The market started in 1703 and there's still a uh, fish auction house that is over 100 years old. But now this house is not being used to auction off fish. It's being used more for drinking, eating, and even dancing. So while you can find all sorts of fresh food and more, the fish market all started because uh, it was a place to sell fish. Hmm. I guess that makes sense. So you said it was open um, year-round, 
which I can imagine gets very cold during the winter time, and only on Sundays. So why only Sundays? I mean, it seems such a waste to have such a huge and great market and only be open for one day a week. And and it gets even crazier than that. Uh, it's open on only on Sundays, and this is the reason was was so that uh, fishermen could sell their goods, as I said earlier, and that's a tradition. Also, a tradition is that is only open on Sundays until nine thirty a.m., and that is because three hundred years ago, when the uh, fish market first started, the clergy of Hamburg was saying we don't want it to interfere with church, so there was a compromise that it could open early as long as it finished by 9.30 a.m. So during the months of April through October, the market is open from 5 a.m. till 9.30, and then in the winter months, November through March, the market is only open for two and a half hours every Sunday from 7 a.m. to 9.30. Even those short opening hours won't stop thousands from shopping, so have a nice breakfast or even continue partying from the night before. Next up, our German of the Week section where we discuss a prominent person from this week's news, a German citizen, or even a foreigner who we deem an honorary German, who has had an effect, for better or for worse, on German culture, society, or politics. An unfortunately misjudged comment by Angela Freimuth, a parliamentarian in North Rhine-Westphalia, received outrage from her colleagues when she compared education reform to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. According to the news website The Local, she said, September the 11th seems to be a particular day for liberty, particularly today relating to the ending of the freedom of universities in North Rhine-Westphalia. Later on, Freimut, who was wearing a scarf with the American flag design when she spoke in the plenary chamber, apologised, saying that she had not intended to draw a connection between the two events. While there was stunned outrage after her comments, it seems to just be one of those unfortunate events that occurs when you speak without thinking. Politicians are expected to be experts in rhetoric, and one rhetorical skill is to segue from one topic to the other. Freimut misjudged the moment, though. Is this a reason to be angry at her? I personally don't believe so. Now, if she was genuinely trying to leverage a tragedy for political goals, I would perhaps not be so forgiving. But don't we all put our foot in our mouths at some point? For politicians, they happen to make mistakes while on a public platform. Good luck in the future, Ms. Freimuth, but I hope you've learnt your lesson. And that is the end of This Week in Germany, podcast number 38. Remember, if you want some fast and easy German news sent straight to your inbox each week, go to our website, thisweekingermany.de, and sign up for our weekly newsletter. That's right, and if you want to support the podcast without spending a single penny or a single pfennig or cent, however you want to put it, then uh, you can. All you have to do is on our Twitter page, uh, retweet our posts. On our Facebook page, share our posts with your friends, and let's get the word out about This Week in Germany to as many people as possible, and that is really the biggest support that we could ask you for, and thank you very much to all of our supporters who've helped us get this far. Thank you. But uh, until then, uh, in seven days' time, we'll be back with a brand new episode of This Week in Germany. So uh, have a great week and see you next time. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.